Hi, um, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speakers are Alexander Anderson and Andrew Harvey. Alexander is a linguist working as a lecturer in the Department of Ancient Studies at Stellenbosch University, where he teaches Semitic and Afroasiatic languages. Additionally, he works as a researcher in the Department of African Languages, directing projects related to the Bantu, Koei, and Nilotic linguistic families, and in the Department of General Linguistics, where he lectures on multilingualism. The scope of his research is broad and includes the areas of linguistics, cognitive science, complexity theory, philosophy, and open data. He has also contributed to the description and visibility of under-researched and or minority languages in Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and Gambia. Andrew Harvey is a research fellow at the Leiden University Center for Linguistics. The title of his current funded research is Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu, grammatical inquiries in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. His interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through linguistic arts and language contact. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Alexander and Andrew as they give their talk, The Form of Emotions, The Phonetics and Morphology of Interjections in Hadza. Thank you very much, Martha, for this introduction. So the present talk draws on a paper that has been written within the research project, filling and depicting the word interjections and idiophones in Sandawa and Hadza. This project was funded by the Department of African Languages at Stellenbosch University in 2021 and developed in collaboration with the University of Dar es Salaam and Leiden University. The work conducted by Andrew and Rich Richard, who also participates in this project together with Mark Karani from uh, Dar es Salaam, has been developed within a larger language documentation project supported by the Endangered Languages Documentation Program. As its name indicates, uh, our project aims to document, describe, and analyze the lexi lexical class of interjections and idiophones in Sandawa and Hadza. Today, we will present the main findings of the study dedicated to interjections in Hadza only. First, Andrew will provide the background of our research and, and introduce the Hadza people and their language. Next, I will explain the conceptual framework underlying our study, while Andrew will comment on data collection methods. After that, I will evaluate our evidence within the framework answer the research question and locate our findings uh, with, within Hadza scholarship and the theory of interjections. Let me now allow Andrew to introduce the true heroes of our talk, the Hadza people and the Hadza language. Thanks, Alex. So the Hadza people or uh, the Hadza Bay are a group of people who live in and around the Lake Ayasi Basin and who speak a language isolate also called Hadza. Uh, importantly, and as this map shows, uh, the Hadzabe people over the last 100 plus years have been progressively dispossessed of a large portion of the land that they originally inhabited. The map you can see delimits the historical range of where the Hadzabe lived versus a much smaller area that they inhabit now. Um, because of relatively small overall numbers, as well as continuing pressures on their land, uh, the Hadza language and many aspects of Hadza lifeways are considered endangered. In order to give a bit more context, I'd like now to play a brief video compiled by our colleague Richard Griscom, uh, giving some idea of what the Hadza language sounds like. <laughs> So now the activities we've just seen 
uh, in this video represent one view of Hadza life and culture, which is very popular in outsiders' conceptions of them, that is, a hunter-gatherer population. Um, in fact, uh, the Hadzabe lead lifestyles considerably more diverse than just this. And here I am, for example, in Sungu, uh, a Hadza community where many Hadza speaking people are farmers. Thank you, Andrew. Despite important advancement in the documentation and description of Hadza, sever several elements in the lexicon and grammar of this language remain under research. One of the areas that has attracted minimal attention by scholars and constitutes, in our review, a tabula rasa in, scholar, in, in Hadza scholarship concerns interjections. Interjections only feature in Miller's 2008 grammatical notes, where two interjective constructions are merely mentioned. Our study aims to address this gap in Hadza scholarship by providing a systematic analysis of the interjective category in this language. The study will be developed within a cognitive prototype driven approach to categorization, which I have used uh, commonly in my studies. The category of interjections in, uh, is understood as a ra radial network of constructions that exhibit a varying extent of similarity with an interjective prototype ranging from total to marginal compliance. Items that fully comply with the prototype are, are canonical and are placed in the center of the category in both conceptual and topological terms. In contrast, items whose compliance is only minimal are not canonical and populate, populate the category's peripheries. As a result, the category emanates from its nucleus, exemplified by the prototype, to the margins where it gradually transmutes into other categories. The key element in this radial network model is the prototype. Given cross-linguistic, both, both uh, synchronic and diachronic, as well as cognitive evidence, scholars have proposed a cumulative set of prototypical interjective features, semantic, pragmatic, phonetic, morphological, and syntactic. While all these prototypical features are relevant and jointly demarcate the prototype, three features are of a particular importance. A prototypical interjection is A, an entrenched construction, construction that B, expresses feelings and sensations experienced by the speaker, and C, can be used holophrastically as a non-elliptical utterance. It is with these three criteria that, uh, in mind, that, uh, which can be viewed, in fact, as a simplified by operationalized definition of interjections, that we proceed to collect, collect hazard interjective constructions during our fieldwork in 2000. 21. The semantic aspect of the definition presented above implies that our understanding of interjections is much more restrictive or somewhat, somewhat more restri restrictive than most definitions used traditionally in scholarship. Specifically, uh, uh, it does, however, comply with the new wave of research on interjections emerging in the second and third decade of this century, specifically approximate, approximating Bernd Heine's uh, approach to interjections with you only the so-called emotive interjections as belonging to the interjective category. In contrast, the so-called conative, volative, olfatic interjections are left outside. This understanding of the category of interjections is also compatible with the models advocated recently by Stange in 2016, as well as myself with Mawande Tlali and other colleagues since 2020. In these models, emotive interjections uh, are understood as interjections proper, or semantically and pragmatically canonical, while the remaining types, conative, volative, and phatics, are interjections, formally speaking, or semantically and pragmatically non-canonical. So overall, the, follow the, the following nine phonetic and morphological prototypical features or properties were important for us. A prototypical interjection is monosyllabic, vocalic in nature, contains a guttural, extra systematic sound or sounds combinations, and is marked with regards to phonation. It is also monomorphemic, does not contain inflections, derivations, or compounded elements, and is opaque. Given the framework uh, adopted in, uh, in our research and the scope of our study, we want to respond to the following research question. 
does the interjective category in Hadza comply with the formal, that is phonetic and morphological features associated with the interjective prototype in current scholarship? And should this be the case, what is the extent of this compliance? Now, Andrew will contextualize our field activities and explain the data collection methods. Thanks, Alex. So in terms of the data and the data collection methodologies we'll discuss today, it came about during a larger project conducted by Richard Griscom and I, uh, with the goal of creating a large multimedia documentation of the Hadza language. Um, so the project began in late 2019 and continues, albeit in a reduced form up to today. Um, despite relatively low speaker numbers relative to other languages in the area, Hadza communities are spread over a large area. So in order to uh, include as many speakers as possible, our project involved training Hadza speaking people as local researchers who themselves made recordings of language use in their own communities. So each point on this map represents a place visited by Richard and I, and this might be a place that we conducted research in or we did not. Um, and each blue icon of the hikers here represents what people would think of as a traditional Hadza camp uh, visited by Richard and I. And, and of course, there are others. Uh, and each yellow house icon represents what we called a field station. And these were generally houses or other structures, sometimes community structures, which we equipped with solar panels and uh, where teams of two local researchers would charge their equipment and conduct most of the translation and transcription of the recordings. So here's another video montage, again, prepared by Richard Griscom, showing the kinds of materials recorded using this local researcher model. Now, it is in this context that uh, Alex approached us wondering if we could collect some data on Hadza interjections. Uh, because my personal orientation is, heaven, is sort of heavily oriented towards natural speech, I initially thought that we could build a list of interjections mainly by just going through our natural speech recordings and identifying the interjections as they occurred in um, their contexts. Um, indeed, this would uh, be the ideal in terms of quality of data. However, very early on, it became clear that in order to build a large list of interjections, we would need to be working with a very large amount of natural speech. And because this material has to sort of be translated and transcribed by our local researchers, there's a certain lag time. Um, so this is still a desideratum, but in order to at least make a start on the project, we decided to try eliciting interjections to see if this would yield the forms a bit more efficiently. Um, so how does one go about eliciting interjections? I, I personally never attempted to do something like this. Um, and Alex provided some examples of the types of interjections for which he was looking, often responses to external stimuli or expressions of emotions. I had doubts about directly asking Hadza speakers about what sounds they might make in certain situations, um, eliciting these. And, and so I, I wanted to elicit these forms in a slightly larger context. I, that, that was sort of my preference. So um, eventually I settled on developing a long list of kind of short skits in which two willing speakers would encounter a stimulus and would react to it. Um, so here is one example in which Gonga, the speaker to the right, reacts with slight exasperation to John Jaiko, the speaker on the left's mention of an annoying foreign researcher who keeps bothering them with his silly questions. <laughs> Here we can hear Gonga uh, produce an mm? It's a long bilabial nasal with an extra high tone. 
which was the kind of thing we were looking for as part of this project. And these skits were then transcribed and translated by the local researchers who then on their own tried to elicit some interjections with their own using similar skits. Uh, and in the end, I think everyone approached the task with good humor. And though not all skits resulted in the production of an interjection, many of them did, uh, such as this one in which Mamasara reacts to Nange telling her there's a scorpion on her leg. So thank, thank you, Andrew. Yes, and in total, our fieldwork activities allowed us to collect 42 interjections or constructions that comply to some extent, at least with the definition provided uh, above. This, this table presents all these tokens in the IPA transcription. It also provides the meanings of the interjections, that is the emotions and or sensations that uh, the respective forms express. The vast majority of Hadza interjections, 74%, are monosyllabic. Most of the plurisyllabic forms themselves exhibit a replicative structure and are built around identical monosyllabic segments. One plurisyllabic interjection arises from the compounding of two monosyllabic segments, each of which is attested as an independent interjection. Overall, only four interjections, which is less than 10%, are truly plurisyllabic. The interpretation of the evidence related to the so-called vocalic nature of interjections is a quite uh, a, a complex matter. To begin with, only four interjections are entirely made up out of vowels. Further, six interjective lexemes also lack proper consonants, but contain an approximate in addition to a vowel or some vowels. The remaining 30 interjections draw on genuine consonantal material. In fact, 14 are entirely made up of consonants, while the further 16 uh, interjections make up and uh, make use of both consonants and vowels or approximants. All of this could suggest that vocalism it's not, is not a dominant tendency in Hadza interjections. However, the analysis of the types of consonants attested in interjections blurs that picture. Uh, so the consonants that are used most frequently in interjections, the glottal stop, the pharyngeal voiced continuant, and the bilabial nas nasal are not canonical consonants. In fact, they are either forms that share various properties with vowels and or, or approximant, approximants. Among the remaining consonants, three main classes can be distinguished, clicks, fricatives, and laterals. And overall, the most canonical consonants, such as voiceless plosives, which are located uh, uh, or occupy the highest position on the sonority scale, are either unattested or the presence results solely from borrowing. Furthermore, the majority of interjections are onsetless. They begin with a pure vowel. When an onset is attested, it absolutely tends to consist of an approximate, either guttural or labio, labio, uh, labio, labio velar. A guttural component is also a pervasive feature of Hadza interjections. While jo uh, when Johnny uh, considering all glottal, epiglottal, and pharyngeal consonants, the total number of occurrences, occurrences of gutturals ascends to 31 cases that are spread across 19 lexemes. This guttural component also transpires in the types of vowels that are predominantly used, namely the vowel A. Since gutturals are viewed as containing the place category of A, which is characteristic by, characteristic by its nature of all A-type vowels, the commonness of a guttural component in consonants would have its vocalic equivalent in the preference for the A vowel in interjections. The majority of interjections contain systematic, uh, fully systematic forms. However, two types of phonetic extra systematicity can be uh, or is attested. First, two sounds that do not form part of human language or the core of human language uh, in general and do not feature in the, in the international phonetic alphabet are found in Hadza. We, we have a whistle as an interjection and a spit also as an interjection. Uh, 
The other class of extra systematic sounds involve sounds that, although attested in the languages of the world, are absent in the standard phonetic repertoire of Hadza. Five such sounds are attested, a, a bilabial click, three gutturals, and the central vowel Regarding click consonants, we have observed that their frequency interjections is slightly lower than in Hadza in general. Clicks constitute a highly common feature in Hadza lexicon, and according to some estimates, at least 28% of all verbal roads contain a click. As far as interjections are concerned, clicks are attested only in six lexemes, which amounts to less than 15%, a half of what one would expect. This could be related to the vocalic character of interjections mentioned above. The more pervasive instances of extra systematicity are visible in phonotactics and prosody. What, uh, with regards to phonotactics, contrary to what typifies the lexical classes of nouns and verbs, monosyllabicity and open syllables prevail in interjections. The pattern built around a syllabic consonant is common a con contrastive vowel glottalization is attested, and some types of vowel occurrence constraints are not observed. With regards to prosody, interjections exhibit three potentially phonemic degrees of vocalic and consonant consonantal length, that is short, long, and extra long. And as a result, they contrast with nominal and verbal voca vocabulary in which only vowels are length sensitive and distinguish no more than two, uh, two degrees, uh, short and long. Similarly, interjections allow for four types of tones. That is, in, a, in addition to high and long tones, which are found in uh, the larger system of nouns and verbs, interjections attest to extra high and extra long tones. Lastly, interjections may be realized with marked phonation for instance, very loudly, or with its distinctive energy. And plurisyllabic interjections also tend to exhibit harmonious patterns. They exhibit identical vowels in all the syllables or attest to replicative uh, rhythmic sequences. Non-harmonious patterns are much less common, being only attested in three interjections, one of which is uh, secondary. Uh, with regards to morphology, the vast majority of Hadza interjections, more than 80%, are truly monomorphemic. They are unsegmentable into more basic meaning bearing units, neither, neither synchronically nor diachronically. While morphological simplicity predominates and predominates clearly, some interjections seem to consist of more than one elementary unit. Three types of such, in our view, still very limited morphological complexity can be distinguished in Hadza, replication, compounding, and suffixation. First, five interjections are built around a single basic unit that is either reduplicated, triplicated, or quadru uh, quadruplicated. Second, the interjection that expresses the sensation of cold, heat, and bitterness seems to have emerged from the compounding of two more basic interjective elements, one that communicates strong taste and the other that communicates pain. And third, there is some evidence suggesting that the interjection Hadze has a, a bimorphemic structure built around the root Hadza, meaning person, human, and an element that when suffix caused the change of the final A to E. No interjection contains inflections. The use of derivations is also highly sparse, being limited to above mentioned suffixation in Hadze, and the various replicative mechanisms which, uh, uh, which are used in interjections are more expressive and phonetic than genuinely derivative and morphological. Overall, Hadza, in, uh, in Hadza interjections may be regarded as lexically opaque. This means that uh, the morphology of any given interjection does not automatically and on its own assign that lexeme like, to an interjective category. First, in, in interjectivizers <laughs> that would mark words or constructions for the interjective status are absent in Hadza, as it's very typical across languages. 
Second, a variety of morphonemic strategies are available to interjections. Indeed, interjective lexemes are virtually compatible with any morphophonetic structure. So even though, as we have explained in this talk, certain tendency with regard uh, of the form can be identified, they are not, uh, so to speak, universal. Overall, the evidence provided in this talk suggests that Hadza interjections largely comply with the interjective prototype. They meet most of the prototypical properties, both with regards to phonetics and morphology. They are prototypical. Apart from responding to this research question, the results of our study also have some implications for the general scholarship of Hadza and the scholarship of interjections. So our findings demonstrate that if the interjective system is taken into account, the diversity of forms, as well as the diversity of the phonotactic and prosodic patterns that are grammatical in Hadza is much or significantly, significant, significantly greater than previously assumed. In some respects, especially with regard to phonotactics and prosody, the interjective system is richer than the system attested in nouns and verbs. With regards to phones, however, the interjective system is merely distinct from the nominal and verbal system, being both more restrictive and richer. Although interjections do not constitute a particularly large class if compared to nouns and verbs, our fieldwork also suggests that they appear quite commonly, commonly in spoken discourses and play a very important role in communication. Therefore, interjections should not be marginalized and viewed as a system that is essentially different from what could be viewed as a proper or core Hazard language system. In fact, it, it is probable that the phonetic and morphological properties exhibited by interjections are not limited to the interjective category, but also transpire in all the other types of inter interactives, especially idiophones, onomatopoeias, conative animal calls or directives, attention signals, response signals, and response elicitators. Our preliminary work on idiophones and conative animal calls seem to corroborate this hypothesis. Consequently, the full picture of the Hazard language would emerge from the combination of the properties attested in the so-called sentence grammar, which typify, for instance, nouns and verbs, and the interactive grammar, including interjections. Overall, Hazza as a language isolate corroborates the validity of the prototype postulated in scholarly literature. The exceptions that are attested in Hadza are fully commensurated with the exceptions that are found in other languages. That is, most violations of the phonetic and morphological features associated with the prototype appear in secondary interjections. Replication is a phonetic rather than a derivative mechanism. Compounding tends to be limited to interjections themselves and while extra systematic forms are tolerated and do appear in interjections, they are certainly not common. The common type of extra systematicity rather involves phonotactics and prosody. Our study also confirms the ability of nouns, especially vocative nouns with the meaning man or people, to be recruited as sources of in secondary interjections and the ability of interjections to be borrowed. Additionally, the present study together with the results of the research conducted previously on other languages points towards the extension of the pro interjective prototype by three further pro properties. First, Hazard data as well as the evidence from Maasai suggests that at least in tonal languages, interjections may favor the placement of high tone on the first syllable in plurisyllabic lexemes. Second, Although interjections may host clicks that are otherwise absent in non-interjective lexicon, as is, as is the case of Hadza, clicks seem to be exploited in interjections to a much lesser extent than is the case of a non-interjective system in click languages. And the system exhibited in some other types of interactives, especially conative animal calls in both click and non-click languages. Third, 
And especially, and, uh, and perhaps most importantly, in fact, our study provides some more evidence confirming the relevance of a guttural component in interjections. Crucially, the guttural component is not limited to consonants as previously observed, but is equally pervasive in the so-called R feature patent, uh, uh, patent in vowels. In other words, glottal, epiglottal, and pharyngeal consonants, as well as uvular and velar fricatives, if a language lacks glottal, epiglottal, and pharyngeal phones, and the a type vowel found in interjections would be a manifestation of the same or exactly the same, in fact, phenomenon. While the available data suggests that the three properties should be included in the set of prototypical features, this proposal remains provisional, being, of course, contingent on its uh, positive verification by a much larger sample of languages. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we would be very happy to answer uh, your questions. All right, and it looks like we already have two questions, so I will go ahead and call on Bonnie. Hi, thanks for the talk. <laughs> so when you're talking about the uh, uh, pharyngeals, it makes me think about how infant language has a lot of pharyngeals. You know, uh, if you look at the, uh, the child acquisition literature, very small infants that have just a ton of pharyngeals. And so I'm wondering, uh, but I, I also, when people meet me and know I work on clicks, they say, oh yeah, you know, they talk about knowing infants who make clicks, or I, I teach them some of the sounds and they say, oh yeah, my kid used to make that sound. So <laughs> uh, I guess I, I'm just thinking, stepping back and, and not, you know, I have already sent you comments on this paper, but in terms of how interjections arise, have we maybe not thought about the creative role of children enough in this process? And certainly in English, certain interjections have become written down and now we pronounce them as if they're words, you know, like, um, like uck or yuck, right? Instead of just, ugh, I'm sure that was just how ugh was spelled. And now we say yuck as if it were a word. So I wonder if this, if there might, if in any of your cross-linguistic studies, there might be evidence for this uh, process of going into a, an actual lexical item from an interjection. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Uh, this is a great question. And thank you so much for uh, your previous comments on, on, on this paper. It, they were absolutely fantastic. And we tried, we incorporated uh, most of them in our revised version. So thank you so much. And uh, re uh, regarding that, this question, so uh, I don't think we have a direct data that would, uh, I don't have such such direct evidence relate, related, uh, relating uh, child language and, uh, and uh, these types of interjections, but I know that such studies have been done on English, for instance, but uh, since interjections are actually bodily gestures or originate as bodily gestures, there's this very strong uh, embodiment driven uh, uh, iconicity almost of interjections. So respiration plays a uh, extremely important role. And, and, and this may explain this relation with gu guttural uh, component, which is uh, basically the enact an enactment of, of respiration. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so I think there is a strong iconic component in interjections, uh, which uh, yeah, this is definitely related to, to embodiment, I, I, I think. Thank you. From, from a methodological perspective, I would love to see, uh, I would love to see uh, research like the kind that uh, Alice Mitchell conducted just across the river, actually in Eshkesh with, uh, with Datoga children growing up in a Datoga compound. Uh, and, and she was, um, paying attention to how they use language and, and what that sort of said about their worldview. I would love to see a, a project like that uh, conducted with a, uh, with a Hadza community. I think it would be fantastic. But of course, that's just, uh, that's just musing. Anna Maria? Yeah, thanks for the wonderful talk uh, to both of you. And uh, Alex, thank you very much for um, reminding me today <laughs> to come. I have a question, uh, two questions, one for both of you and one that goes more to Alex. Uh, my first question is, um, 
uh, about how did an, uh, an interjection make it into your corpus? The reason I'm asking is that I had um, some of the material that Alex used with the Chwao community. Uh, I took that to the field and I tried a little bit with a community I know well uh, where I did my PhD. And the fact is that uh, no two speakers seem to produce the same interjection. So I, I then quickly gave up and thought, okay, probably there's not much there in this language that is codified. And uh, it seems that Matthias Frenzinger observed a bit the same in Que. So how did you um, decide if an interjection should go into the corpus or if it was just an idiosyncratic thing that was produced by one guy uh, randomly? And my second question has to do with uh, the interjections and the clicks. You said that Hatsa has 28% uh, of click lexicons, so most Kalaharic languages I work with have about 50 to 60%, some a bit higher than the central Kalahari. And it also, as the few interjections that have been studied, and it also seems that uh, that is quite reduced. Uh, Alex, could you comment how this is in re relation to Chua, since this is a language I know? So yeah, that's my question. Thanks, Anna Maria. Um, in in terms of in terms of that methodological question, um, again, I think I always looked at sort of the material that we have in the corpus as a start, um, and uh, I would really like to see what we get out of uh, you know from from combing through these natural speech uh, recordings. I think that you know these will be much more embedded in the actual sort of use of the language. Um, and I'm excited for that. It's just I think it's a it's a question of practicality, just how much how much material we need. Um, so in in this case, the stuff that made it into our sort of corpus was the stuff that was produced during these during these skits. Um, and uh, we would what we tried to do was we tried to get sort of a basis based on based on Gonga and Chanjaiko that particular day. Um, but what we did then was our local researchers uh, went with this material um, and they showed videos to uh, other people. And they said, listen, are there any other circumstances in which you can use this sound? Mm? Or can you use this you know, other sound? And that sort, of, that sort of gave us recordings with similar sounds, with different sounds. Some didn't have any. So um, I think it's I think it's a very sort of preliminary approach, but we did get repetition in many cases. But that's super interesting, actually. Yeah. But this this idea about the codification of uh, interjections is really interesting as well, and is something that I entirely did not think of. Um, and uh, when sort of we go to pick this up again, I think and go a little bit deeper, I think that's definitely something important that um, we need to take in, into account. So I, I really I really appreciate that. I think there are cross linguistic patterns also because I had the same with onomatopoeia where it seems that things are either lexicalized or random. So there is, um, which was very different in Chua. So um, yeah, this will be very interesting once there's a big cross linguistic corpus to see uh, if there's also aerial things arising. I'm really excited. Yeah. Cool. Great work. Yeah, so to, to, to add to what Andrew explained brilliantly, it's uh, that, as he said, that uh, our tokens are repeated. Uh, we have recordings of the same tokens, of almost the same tokens in more than one, on, on more than one occasion in our database. And what, what I observed in my previous research on interjections is, and that's, I think is, uh, is, uh, is it makes actually is, is logical. So the more interjection is integrated into the standard system of a language that is also used in other lexical classes, the more actually stabilized across speakers it is. And the more uh, iconic, the more expressive it is, the bigger variation of performance there is among speakers. So the more gesture, vocal gesture like it is, then the speakers may, 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 may change this uh, interjection and sort of adapt, adapt it. So they can, they can vary. But the more uh, lexicalized, as you answered, lexicalized it is, the, the 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 smaller the scope of variation and and performance uh, there is actually so this is uh, I would say correlated what I've observed in in my previous research and uh, related to to your to your second question uh, 
about about the clicks. So I remember that in Chihuahua we we don't have actually we don't have uh, I don't remember what is the standard estimate of uh, of clicks in. Uh, in Chihuahua in general. About 40% in Chihuahua. 40%. I, I just looked it up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I made that calculation. So in interjections, even because because what we did in our paper on interjections, we, we used this older uh, understanding of interjections where we included also volative interjections, conative calls to animals, and phatic interjections, which are uh, not comparable with what we did today. But when I checked actually only emotive interjections, there's there, there are very few fewer clicks, certainly fewer clicks than 40% or something like that. It's, 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 there are really uh, much fewer interjections that would make use of clicks. They again make, uh, they are, I remember there are interjections that are only vocalic, there are interjections with guttural component. And of course there are many interjections with approximants. There are much fewer interjections that would, uh, that would contain clicks. So I think clicks on the other hand are extremely, uh, common in in or more common in uh, conative calls to animals. I and I remember that in Chihuahua again in animal calls there that's the category that we had a lot of clicks and even clicks that don't exist in Chihuahua elsewhere, like bilabial click that was in Chihuahua. So I think interjections generally really tend uh, because of this vocalic nature they uh, are not, uh, they, they may contain clicks, even clicks that don't exist in the language, but overall as a lexical class, they would contain fewer clicks than elsewhere if the language is a click language. Thank you. Thanks a lot to you both. That uh, was a really nice answer. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Michael. Thank you very much, Alex and Andrew for your interesting talk. Uh, just wanted to know a little bit uh, about um, whether there are any gender specific interjections, as you, as you may remember in Maasai, we, we had uh, some interjections that are really specific for, uh, let's say, female or male. And uh, the second uh, point is you mentioned about um, what seems to be a suffix or interjectionalizer, uh, E and a glottal sound. Um, uh, is this productive in the sense that do you have other? Um, uh, let's say secondary um, tokens that can be um, can take uh, e and and the glottal sound for it to qualify to be an interjection. And another social linguistic aspect is about the probability of interjections. And you, you mentioned this, and I'd like to know whether um, um, uh, what are the languages that are eligible to for the Hadza to borrow, you know, some tokens and 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 make use in their language. Thank you very much. I'm sure. So to, to start with your last question first, Michael, and uh, Alex can can uh, jump in afterwards if I didn't get everything. I mean, Hadza is is in is in pretty robust, I would say, contact with, you know, with at least. So there are different levels, of course. It's it's more complicated than what I'm going to make it out to be, I think. But you know, Hadza Hadza has has contact in in sort of a recent. Uh, time scale with you know languages bantu languages like sukuma and ihanzu um and of course swahili which many if not most uh hadza people also speak um and uh recent contact with um with uh, the cushitic language iraq and uh the nilotic language uh datoga as well so there there are lots of uh, there are lots of places where uh, where hadza could borrow or could uh, be or or Hadza lexicon could be borrowed from uh, interjections in this case. Um, in terms of in terms of identifying any sort of identifying any sort of borrowings for certain, I mean, you know, that sort of remains to be seen. I think one that really jumped out to me was this uh, was this uh, what is it the what do they call it the uh, the the teeth kissing the or I can't do it. If somebody is displeased, you know, we saw that a couple times, and um, that to me, I mean, you know, maybe I'm watching too many bongo movies, but it seems like a very Swahili thing. Maybe, maybe an East African or a Pan African thing. I don't know, uh, but that was certainly present. And when I saw it, I said, "Well, that's not the first time I've seen that." So yeah, Andrew, uh, Andrew is completely correct. But we have one interjection certainly borrowed from Swahili, which is "talk." 
no, which uh, comes from uh, which also we have, we have in Maasai to scare animals and drive them away, toka. No, so th this is this is definitely an aerial uh, uh, scene. and what what Andrew mentioned, and that's completely true. And I think I've observed that in my previous research on interjections. Again, the interjections that are more iconic, they tend to be cross linguistically uh, similar. But now it's a question. I, I think it's less related to, to, to borrowing, it's more this iconicity. So the more bodily gesture they are, uh, the more likely it is that they are actually, pro, uh, uh, they emerge spontaneously and the similarities are just because of, of, of iconicity. But in this case, because there is this, what Andrew mentioned, this very close connection with, oh, yeah. with other languages in the area, of course, this clique may have spread to, so across an, an area, and it's, I think it's a, very difficult to, to, to determine once for all that it's a borrowing or aerial spread, spreading, no? Uh, I, I forgot about the toke, um, uh, <laughs> Alex, the, 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 that was said to, the, to chase the dog away. Um, and and it, was, it, was, um, it was definitely, uh, you know, uh, we can flag that. Do, do Hadza people speak to dogs in Swahili as a rule? That will have to be something that we'll need to look at in the future, I think. <laughs> look that in, in Kosa, the, uh, uh, the, the most common interjection used to scare dogs is actually taken from, uh, uh, from, from Afrikaans. Tsek, futsek. And in Zulu, in Zulu to, to scare the dog, you use Gowan, which is go on or go away it comes from uh, from english so so but th th there is i think sociological explanation why these words were were uh, used uh, with such a pejorative meaning in uh, in in in, in goni languages but uh, here i actually I, I yeah i don't know why 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 toka from swahili <laughs> bad associations i don't know <laughs> there was some other question i don't remember one was one was about gender specific uh, uh, um, interjections. We didn't see any of those, did we? No, we didn't. We couldn't establish any gender specificity. Exactly what Michael mentioned is extremely important. Interesting that in Maasai there is a large number of interjections that are specifically used, emotive interjections that are specifically used by either men or women, and they can't be. It's not the preference. It's just a gender uh, sort of. Uh, class you, you can't just uh, you know thank you michael jeremy yes um, let me begin by saying thank you to both of you for a great presentation this was very interesting for me uh not something not a, a field that i particularly pay much it haven't paid much attention to so it was very interesting to be able to hear about it and especially in relation to the fact that i'm currently in Hadza land and uh, working with the Hadza is interesting for me to be able to realize, oh yes, I have heard these these, these uh, interjections before, uh, but never, never paid too much attention to them. Um, I'd only have, I don't have a question, but I do have just an anecdotal comment. Um, when you were mentioning kind of the uh, prototypical uh, features of interjections, one of them being monomorphicity, um, I, I reminded me of a, an, a conversation I had with the Hadza speaker, I think last week, and we were looking at some specific words in, in the verbs, and uh, we were looking at a, a verb, now I can't remember particularly which one it was or what it meant, but it was a, a, a lateral click followed by an ah, so an ah, and we were kind of looking at how there was a, a contrast between an, a non-aspirated and an aspirated lateral click, um, with a, a, min, a minimal pair. And as we talked about, he said, actually, there's a third one. There's also one with the glottalized lateral click, ah, and, but this means, you can use it as a verb, meaning he said, ah, he made this interjection, ah, as in like disgust or surprise. And you could actually conjugate it as a verb and stick on a, a past tense clitic, he or she, uh, meaning they said this interjection. So I was curious from, from that experience and then hearing your talk 
I wonder if it would be a question to continue to look at is can other interjections be verbalized in such a way where you can use them and, and conjugate with a clinic that makes them be past tense or future tense or something like that to say they did interjection X um, would be something that would be of interest and I think something could be interesting from that. Very cool data point, uh, Jeremy, and uh, do pass on all our, all our best uh, all our best regards um, from the Rafali network to our colleagues uh, who you'll be uh, seeing. Um, the uh, the uh, the conjugation thing that's an interesting uh, data point, uh, Jeremy. Now, of course, you know, uh, given given you know that we're we're really only sort of just getting into to to Hadza as sort of naturally used in its larger context and working from natural speech. I mean, you know, all bets are off really with what we see, especially I would think since the, um, the inflectional morphology is clitic in nature, right? So it's a little bit, it's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit uh, in terms of the categories it can glom onto, I think it's a little bit more um, flexible than say, for example, a, uh, you know, an inflectional suffix. So that that's really cool. And I think it would be something neat to look at. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. Felix? Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Andrew and uh, Alex for a very fascinating talk. Thank you, Andrew, for letting me to it. Um, I have a kind of a meta level question because I sit here listening and I'm wondering one of the things I'm wondering about is there is a hidden secularity in the argument. That secularity is the following. You, you give a definition of what you think is a prototypical interjection, and then you go look for that, and then you come to tell us back that, yeah, that fits the prototype. I find that a bit secular in a way, but the other side of it, and towards the end, you bring up this distinction between sentence grammar and interactive grammar. But at the same time, you are, we are describing these things which are supposed to be interactive, more in terms of structural features. So we talk about monosyllabicity. We talk about, uh, I don't know, some suffixes and so on. Whereas these things, I mean, and of course, when you take your prototype and then when you get some questions, then you go to the other types of forms that you say are not prototypical interjections to answer those questions. So I'm just wondering whether you can clarify for me whether you, you see this secularity that I feel and whether we shouldn't really think more about the kinds of features that we should use to talk about the things that we say belong to interactive grammar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, no, this is a very good question. And exactly what we tried to do in our paper is to avoid that circularity. So therefore we don't, uh, when we looked for interjections and that's what I explained at the beginning of this, of this talk, we didn't use actually the whole prototype model to look for it because that would indeed be circular if we used uh, phonetic and morphological features to look for interjections and then evaluate this phonetics and morphology giving these features. That would be pure circularity. But we actually collected our interjections mainly by drawing on a pragmatic semantic uh, uh, definition, which is the, the, the expression of emotions and sensations by the speaker. Uh, that, that was the first condition. And the second condition is that this expression, construction, could be used holoprastically as an independent non-elliptical utterance. So this condition was syntactic. So, and the third one was that it should be entrenched. So it wouldn't be uh, idio idiolectal basically. So the three conditions are not phonetic and not morphological. And therefore we will able to test phonetics and morphology because our default operationalized definition is not phonetic and morphological. So given the semantic pragmatic uh, uh, definition uh, of interjection plus uh, um, uh, holoprasticity, we were 
able to determine that what we should what we should find we actually found it our in most cases the interjections collected in Hadza do comply with uh, with the prototype they actually contribute maybe to even for some far, further uh, features of course there are many uh, th there are several cases where, it, where uh, when they do not comply and these cases are also consistent with what has been observed previously in the in the scholarship so the most uh, cases of uh, of the absence of compliance concern the uh, the secondary interjections clearly uh, but you see so, sorry yes. if i may cut in mm -hmm. the definition itself which says something that expresses emotions and then mm -hmm. you go you create situations skit situations to mm -hmm. elicit what you feel would be emotions and then you are looking for particular ways of expressing those emotions and you know that i mean it's a difficult task but i don't i think we have to be careful about how we we argue for this because the and of course one can also ask the question why would you want to say that the to typical interjections are these emotive interjections. That's also a question. Because if, if you go by the interactive grammar, the interactional thing, those interactional functions are all part of things that can go into interjections. So the, there is, uh, yeah. Yes, I, I fully agree. But the, the fact that this this is more related to how one understand lexical classes, I think. And we basically followed Bern Heine's uh, approach to interjections, which is basically the old school emotive interjections. And that helps a little bit us because uh, in that way, we clearly differentiate different semantic or pragmatic functions. And for instance, myself, I, 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 I do see uh, quite important differences, semantic pragmatic differences, which later actually translate onto uh, uh, formal differences, for instance, between emotive interjections and what is traditionally referred to as uh, conative or volitive interjections, and even more fatic interjections. So I think fatic interjections, which are definitely within interactives, there are four, 10 categories. Of course, they are connected. They are connected also through the radial network. One of them are interjections, which old school uh, are related or, or understood as emotives. And we just follow that, uh, that definition. But of course, one can pro provide it a broader definition of interjections, included further categories. It's always possible. And, and look for, for, for different types of prototypes. Prototypes in general are constructs. They don't exist in, in reality. So they are constructed by, by us as linguists and are instantiated in specific languages by speakers. And they have some sort of cognitive reality for speakers within a language. But cross-linguistically, they are constructed by us. So always, they can be, they can be modified. This is a cross-linguistic uh, debate, I think. Rather than just a... one last comment, just la one last comment. Just now, in in your answer to this question, you say there is a way of uh, establishing lexical classes. But you see, for me, when you talk about interactive grammar, we are not talking about lexicon. You see, we are talking about interactional things. We are not talking about a structural analysis or formation of lexical classes but this is a debate we can have forever so i'll just end it there yeah thank um, you very much thank you um i should say felix i i appreciate i appreciate some of these um some of these questions because they they steer us into sort of these what next scenarios or how to sort of how to sort of move move beyond what we what we've currently done in terms of the data collection methodology as well as in terms of how we've described and how we've analyzed what we've looked at. Um, and I think that I think that the current project was a useful exercise in that I think it has forced me to stop ignoring uh, some of these um, uh, forms in my transcription and uh, translation. Uh, I think it lays some interesting um, challenges uh, to sort of that part of my practice. Um, 
because I think if I were to read um, the transcriptions and translations that the local researchers uh, produce, uh, often these sounds are fully ignored, they're glossed over, or if they are written, it's done so rather imprecisely and maybe with um, a rather vague sort of translation. And now instead of me sort of saying, okay, well, you know, we don't know what these are, these are small little words and we don't really know what to do with them. It's very much so a challenge at my feet to say, okay, well, these exist and we need to, and we need to make sure that they are integrated into the natural speech corpus and, you know, we have something to say about them. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that all those questions are valid and I think that they do push us into sort of, sort of new and exciting areas. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm, that's something that I'm, I'm interested in taking on, I think. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Uh, thank you. Um, just wanted to quickly ask if we expect something on animal cause, um, as you know, if, <laughs> if you really got, uh, a feeling in the field uh, because we know hats that do not really um, uh, interact they don't have domestic animals and the only animals they interact with uh, wild animals and should we expect something on uh, animal cause uh, based on your experience in the field thank you i i think it i think it all comes down to looking at the material that um we have um, uh, we have about five terabytes of, of recorded material not for this specific interjections project but actually for for the entire Hadza um, corpus that we've been working on Richard and I and our local uh, researcher colleagues um, recorded over essentially the space of two years in you know in, in a large area all across the Lake Aassi Basin and this sort of covers uh, you know, it covers stories and it covers songs. Uh, so, you know, if we're talking about these sort of uh, things, you know, we have extra, we have, uh, we have non-lexical vocables that can be thrown in here from songs. Um, and we do have, um, we do have some forest, uh, some forest walks and we have stories and, and life histories about interactions with animals. So I wouldn't be surprised if we received stuff like that. Um, I, I remember one of the, um, one of the recordings uh, that I made um, or at least I was part of making, uh, involve calling the honey guide, which is a bird that helps guide uh, honey hunters all across the area to, uh, to honey. Uh, and of course, there, there's a special uh, suite of whistles that are used to interact with the, with the bird and, and, and uh, to help encourage it to bring them to, uh, to particularly rich uh, honey source. So, um, you know, I mean, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, in a very sort of rich, nuanced tradition of engagement with animals. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's sort of all just, you know, it's, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more from here. So yeah, thank you for that question, Michael. And, and actually, even in uh, communities that uh, don't have uh, uh, domestic animals, one can find uh, calls to animals as well and, and, and for wild animals. And in this case, especially dispersals. So I, we just con uh, concluded a, uh, a study on Chihuahua animal calls. And of course, Chihuahua do have uh, uh, domesticated animals, but other koi uh, families, and I spoke to, to Anne Maria, and uh, there is some interesting data that even in uh, hunter-gatherer uh, co uh, communities, uh, there are animal calls. Of, uh, directed to, to to wild animals, of course, not to attract them or to direct them because we don't control them, but to scare them and chase them chase them away. But also sometimes to to attract them. So so there is so definitely this is a very important part of of human life, and definitely there must be uh, cognitive animal calls in 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 Hadza as well. But we would we would have to see how many many they are on average they should be approximately 30 40 uh lexemes so let's see <laughs> maybe we will find them yeah andrew this is you know another idea <laughs> adding to the list yes <laughs> fun I'm quite fascinated by this uh, onset list interjections because it is, you definitely notice that Hadza has very strong onsets, you know, so lexical items are, I would almost say heavily marked by having a strong obstruent onset. 
Although of course we have other sorts of onsets as well, but uh, so, it, and the, the prevalence of pharyngeals, it makes me really wish I knew more about mu pharyngeals because this is a language with clicks and pharyngealized vowels. So would they avoid pharyngeals more or have a lower percentage of those in their interjections? Just as you're saying, Hadza has a lower frequency of uh, click interjections than you might expect. That's a brilliant observation and suggestion, Benny. Thank you so much, Bonnie. That's a really, really excellent. Yeah. You're there. You are in South Africa, so you should uh, go work with the remaining speaker. <laughs> <laughs> find out. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to, to 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 yeah to do that. No, definitely. This is brilliant. Hmm. All right. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 18th of May, presented by Lizzie Poole and is titled The A and A Particles in Mbukwe. And I would like to thank Alexander and Andrew again for their presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar. Thank you.